Reconciliation. It's a word we hear in the news. But what does it mean for us uh, individually and more broadly? Let's take a look at that through the scripture and the message uh, as we proceed in this time of worship. But we begin with a call to worship. Loving God, you call us together to worship God as the people of God. You call us by name and just as we are. You know each of our needs. You know our experiences. You know what rests in our minds and our hearts. And in your love, you call us to worship God as the people of God. We come together, our heads and our hearts and our hands and feet yearning to be remade and redirected to paths of justice and in ways of love. Help us, Jesus, to walk in the paths of justice and love that you yourself have walked, to worship God as the people of God. God invites us to worship as beloved and loving people. Mold us, Holy Spirit, to worship God as the people of God. As we join in this time of worship, we sing, Come, let us sing to the Lord our song. Come, let us sing to the Lord our song. We have stood silently too long. Truly the Lord deserves our praise. So joyfully thank God for our days. O thirsty soul, come drink at the well. God's living waters will never fail. Surely the Lord will help you to stand, strengthen and comforted by God's hand. You dwell among us and cause us to pray and walk with each other. Precious brothers and sisters will grow in the fulfilling love they know. Desert shall bloom and mountains shall sing to the desire of all living things. Come all you creatures high and low, let your Prayer is what binds us in so many ways together, especially when we're apart in this way. And so we pray a prayer of adoration and confession. Living God, from you come vitality, love, and joy. Your peace is our companion. Your love is our strength. Your son is our hope. Your spirit nurtures tiny seeds of purpose and potential hidden in the deep soil of life to surprise us with new life. While the earth begins to bloom around us, we bring you our prayers and praise, trusting that your spirit will renew in us the gifts we need to serve you in faithfulness in the example of Christ our Lord. Living, loving God, as we watch our gardens and our children grow, we confess we often resist the change growth can bring. We form opinions about many things and cling to them. We fear new insights and new directions. Forgive us when we think we already know enough. Grant us faith like the mustard seed, able to grow with your blessing, to become a mighty sign of your lively kingdom among us. God of patience and persistence, speak through the spirit, spirit scriptures and inspire our growth and gratitude so that we may be changed by what we hear. Open our minds and hearts to a fresh encounter with Christ, your living word. Amen. God's love is not logical or understandable, for God forgives those we never would and welcomes those we continue to ignore. This is the one who has mercy on everyone, pouring grace and joy into everyone, including us. Thanks be to God, we are forgiven. We turn now to that scripture reading that I alluded to earlier on uh, that talks about reconciliation. 
hear a word from scripture. The reading today is from Paul to his letter to the Corinthians, his second letter, chapter 5, verses 6 to 21. So we are always confident, even though we know that, we, that while we are at home in the body, we are always from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we do have confidence, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For all of us must appear before the judgment seat of God so that each may receive recompense for what has been done in the body, whether good or evil. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we try to persuade others but by ourselves, we ourselves are well known to God. And I know that we are also well known to your consciences. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you an opportunity to boast about us so that we may be able to answer those who boast in outward appearances and not in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are not in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ urges us on because we are convinced that we are, have, excuse me, because we are convinced that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And we died for all, so that those who live might live no longer for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for them. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, but though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we now know him no longer in that way. For we, for if anyone is in Christ, those who, there is no creation, everything old has passed away. So everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to themselves through Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. For this, in Christ, God has reconciled the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against him, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. We entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, we make him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Fractured relationships. They seem to be all around us and not one of us is immune. Even in my own extended family, there have been fractures in relationships between siblings. It started with my mom's death and moved from there to circumstances in the world. COVID to politics has made, speak, made the fractures all the more real. It is not that we don't get along, but the ability to speak freely has gone by the wayside. Each of us measures our conversations and then dips and measures so that we continue to be able to spend time together, love one another, and then depart on good terms. It is not that we haven't 
always had differences of opinion, but we are far more careful now about how we express those opinions than we once were. I've heard this being the case for many families in this time that we are living in. Though fractures and fault lines have always been a part of relationships, it seems even more pronounced. Having said that, even the family I married into has had its share of trouble long before the world seemed to change in 2020. Brothers and sisters estranged from each other with battles over property and rights. Who did what and who deserves this or that? Us humans are difficult people. And these fractures are seen in our community, in our nation, and in the world. I don't have to tell anyone about the challenges of the political landscape here in Canada and how politicians and those who back them can be at odds. Can you even imagine a political stage in Canada where party leaders work together for the good of the people and not only for the good of winning the next election? That kind of cooperation and respect would transform what and how things are done while creating an environment that values and makes decisions based in the well-being of everyone. Or a world where those who have abundance freely share with those who have not been so fortunate. Where the care of everyone becomes a reality, not because it was forced, but because everyone saw the benefit of equity in education, health care, housing, food security, and so much more. When we look globally, the fractures get even more significant. From the elections and the crazy that is the politics in the U.S. to the war in Ukraine and the insanity of the Gaza Strip. And all of these things are just what we hear about regularly. How often are the struggles of people in Muslim or predominantly black countries even making our news feeds? We don't know the half of the challenges going on. So we sit with all of this feeling like there is very little we can do to change our own circumstances, let alone that of the nation or world. Fractures in relationships have been the norm for humans since nearly the beginning of time. Though the story of Adam and Eve is one handed down to us, it is the first story we have of a fracture of human relationships with one another, creation, and God. That story of Adam and Eve and the apple being tempted by the serpent and giving in to the temptation set Adam and Eve against each other, separated them from God, and even affected the way they lived in the beautiful creation that had been set apart for them. It is a story that speaks to the human condition. We continue to have challenges and relationships between ourselves and God, and the concerns over climate change is a prime example of how we are at odds with nature. In the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians, the broken relationship is evident. This, this writing is more like a personal letter and speaks to the hardship and challenges in the relationship between Paul and this particular community of faith. In the reading from today, Paul starts out talking about living by faith, and moves into what a ministry of reconciliation looks like. And it is that reconciliation piece that is the focus for us today. When Paul writes, he writes as one who at one time went after Christians in order to put a stop to their witness and work, even to the point of killing people. As a zealous man of the Jewish faith, one with authority, he was going to make sure that nothing threatened the status quo of his religion. And he did it from a place where he was sure he was right, where change was unwanted and threats to the religion that he was so sure about were to be dismantled. And then he changed. He had a Damascus Road experience that rocked his world to the point that he became the change maker the instigator for making disciples of Christ. This time, he would do it from a place of love and not hate. He would build communities of faith that would bring the love of Christ into the world. Paul came to realize that Jesus was more than a mere human being. 
Jesus was God's son, and that changed everything, including how he would see and live with others. It meant seeing the world and all that it was from the point of view of Jesus' love and God's grace. These things given as a gift in Jesus and the sending of the Holy Spirit to be our teacher and guide. Paul wrote, from now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we were what, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we now, we know him no longer in that way. In other words, yes, Jesus, Jesus was a human and walked among people, but things changed with the resurrection of Jesus. There was something much bigger at work. At the time that Paul was writing the second letter to the Corinthians, there were still fractures in the community of faith and with Paul himself. In his writing, he was looking for ways to reconcile the community to himself and to God, as well as to each other. And so he looks to the example of what God was doing in Christ. Again, we hear from Paul in verses 18 and 19. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. God's reconciling act is to be an example to us about how to be in relationship with one another. But even the fact that reconciliation is needed shows that broken relationships happen. If we are to live into our Christian faith as followers of Christ, then we are called to find ways to reconcile our personal relationships, looking also beyond ourselves into the community and more broadly to the relationships in our nation and in the world. If that sounds like a tall order, well, it is. And once again, We do not do it perfectly, and sometimes we do not even do it well. In our humanness, there will always be relationships that we cannot reconcile. We are human, and we are broken, and sometimes the hurt is too deep, the danger too real, in order to reconcile. Still, we strive to be image bearers of God where we respond to the brokenness around us, Restore what can be restored and rejoice when reconciliation happens. I would be remiss if I didn't say something about our relationships with Indigenous people on this Indigenous People's Sunday. I will do it from the point of the work done and yet to be done in the Presbyterian Church in Canada. This first week of June, when I was at General Assembly, a key moment happened when the Assembly stood together to hear the apology of the PCC to those who experienced the trauma of residential schools run by the Presbyterian Church in Canada. I take the following from an article written for the PCC. As a church that ran 12 residential schools, we bear a collective responsibility to truth and healing. In the 1980s and 1990s, the truth about abuses children suffered at residential schools began to be heard. Over the next decades, more truth about the pain and harm inflicted at the schools have become part of our common memory, in large part because of the courage of survivors and intergenerational survivors who are standing against a legacy of colonial violence and racism, seeking healing from their harmful and deadly impacts. June 3rd, 2024, marked 30 years since the church adopted its 1994 confession, which acknowledges the church's complicity in a deadly assimilation effort that targeted Indigenous children. In its report to the 2023 General Assembly, the National Indigenous Ministries Council articulated the need for an apology that reflects the now greater understanding of the profound harm these institutions, residential schools, caused and continue to cause to generations of Indigenous people. Members of the church are invited to engage in collective and group learning about the need for an apology, the legacy of residential schools, and intergenerational trauma, the roots of 
indigenous racism, our responsibility and commitment to uphold the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, and what is needed for truth, healing, and justice for Indigenous peoples. This includes in worship, which is central to our faith, life, and community. As I said, the apology was made at the General Assembly this year. It was humbling to be present. And I will always give thanks that I was present in the moment it was first read aloud in the PCC. This fall, on September 29th, the Sunday closest to September 30th, which is the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, the apology will be read in this church. Reconciliation, whether in our personal lives, in our community, with indigenous people of our nation, and reconciliation in the broad sense of our country and our world is our responsibility as Christians. From the Apostle Paul we hear, so we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. We entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. To be reconciled to God means that we bring that work of reconciliation to our lives and that of others. We are Christ's ambassadors in the world and our ministry is reconciliation bringing wholeness and healing to lives in any way we can. We do it in Christ, with Christ, and through Christ. Amen. And now we gather together our thoughts and emotions, what we've heard, and we hold it all in the prayers of the people. Let us pray. Gracious God, you hold all things in your hands. We may plant seeds, but it is your mysterious power that brings forth growth. We play our small parts, but you awaken new life. Thank you for our place in your purposes. Guide our plans for ministry in the days ahead. We pray for the work of our church and our government in pursuing truth and reconciliation with Canada's Indigenous peoples. We pray for Indigenous communities which lack clean water to drink and health care close at hand. And for all those mourning the loss of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Guide decision makers to act with timely courage and compassion for justice to be done. Awaken understanding in those who feel no empathy for the struggle of others. On this day that celebrates fathers, we pray for families in war-torn country communities where celebration is an impossible dream. We pray for fathers and families who face financial hardship and worry for the well-being of their children. And we pray for any who feel empty or lonely this day who feel feared the future or more in the past. As summer holidays draw closer, guide families to meaningful to find meaningful opportunities to enjoy each other and the world on their doorsteps. Gracious God, you hold all things in your hand, including us. Be with all those who carry on in spite of loss or grief, and with those who face pain or uncertainty about their future. Keep us open to your Spirit's leading in all that we do with and for each other, help us embody the love of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Let us remember those seeds of love, hope, grace, and peace which we carry in our hearts and souls, as well as our wallets and purpose, purses, so that in remembering, we would offer them to our God for the use of the work of reconciliation and hope. Should you wish to support and or would like to learn more about St. Andrew's Presbyterian here in Thunder Bay, get involved with our ministry, or make a donation towards the life and work of this congregation, then I invite you to visit our website at standrewspres-tbay.ca. There you can find ways to give and more information. Well, we have a ministry, a ministry of reconciliation, and so we sing. We have this ministry.
we have this ministry and we are not discouraged it is by God's own power that we may live and serve openly we share God's word speaking truth as we believe praying that the shadowed world may healing light receive we have this ministry oh god receive our living oh christ the tree of life our end and our beginning we grow to fullest flower when rooted in your love brothers sisters clergy lay call to service by your grace different cultures different gifts the young the old in place we have this ministry Oh, God, receive our giving. The yoke of Christ is ours. The whole world is our parish. We daily take the cross, the burden and the joy. Bearing hurts of those we serve, wounded, bruised, and bowed in pain. Holy Spirit, bread and wine, we die and rise again. We have this ministry. Oh, God, receive our loving. The God who has reconciled us to one another as well as the holy community, sends us forth. We go to gather the broken as we bring healing in our hands. Jesus, who has shaped us into new people with his grace-filled hands, sends us forth. We go to welcome those we have ignored, drawing the stranger in to a warm embrace. The Spirit who teaches us how to look at others with the eyes of love and hope sends us forth. We go to become one with those tossed aside, to be the community of hope for which they have searched. May we go with the grace of God, the love of Christ, and in communion with the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>